please stand with me one more time for this morning. Sunday school service 201. 201, grace greater than our sins. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Marvelous grace of our Good morning. Oh, good to see Brother Will and Sister Kim getting in there in the back. I don't know that he's all well yet, but he's well enough to be here, so praise the Lord. Amen, brother. Amen. Okay, let's look with me, please, in your Bibles, first of all, to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12. This is our verse that we've been studying for weeks. This, in fact, this is today on the 21st of August is our 21st lesson in this verse, so... I'm, I'm trying, I, I can never really rival Pastor, but I'm following in his example to spend months on a single, you know, study or single verse. And here we are with 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12. We talk about this as the testimony of our conscience, and we talk about this as Paul's ministry summation. And what a, what this would, this would be a pretty decent uh, verse to have inscribed on your tombstone, I think. But anyway... The verse says, for our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. We've been spending quite a bit of time now on, but by the grace of God, uh, we want to go ahead and put that up there. We were looking at Titus chapter 2 is where we've been springing out from because of what the grace of God uh, teaches us. Titus chapter 2, verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of a great God, the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So we've been looking at because of, but by the grace of God and what the grace of God means to us. We, we looked at that, we studied that, and now we've been looking at this passage here in, in Titus because this really particularly speaks to me in terms of what grace does. You know, we Baptists sometimes get accused of taking advantage of grace because we believe in eternal security. And even if you want to call it, whether you call yourself a Baptist or a Biblicist or whatever, if you believe uh, as we should in this age of grace, that when we get saved, when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit himself baptizes us into the body of Christ and seals us there himself, a seal that no man can break, not even we ourselves. We are sealed into the body of Christ. This is the only age in which this happens. And so, and that's, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The grace of God is the operative agent, if you will, that God uses through himself to save us. And that grace teaches us, it, it's a, as we've said, sort of a personification of grace that it itself bringeth salvation and teaches us 
these things and teach us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. And we've been saying, how do we do that? Okay, we're supposed to do that. How? You know, we don't, God doesn't give us something to do without enabling us to do it. So how is it? What is God's way for us to deny this ungodliness and worldly lust, to be able to move on to these other things that he wants us to have? We took uh, sort of a, a, a poll. We came up with a number of things, and uh, quite, I'm quite assured that this is not an exhaustive list. There are other aspects, especially if you um, have been walking in this way for a number of years. Perhaps most of us in here have been walking this way for decades. In some cases, at least one decade back there, I see. But at any rate, uh, there are a lot of things that become ingrained just the way we, li we live in an aspect of trying to walk worthy of vocation where we're called, to walk worthy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that become ingrained into who we are. You know, we replace, we purge out the old habits that we had, and we all had them. I don't care if you got saved at 5 or 50, you all, we all had bad habits because for all have sinned to come short of the glory of God, Right? And we had to kind of purge those things out as best we could and bring them into subject, subjection and keep them from influence, denying ungodliness and worldly lust. And so we have developed over time, if you will, you know, the world might call them coping mechanisms or defense mechanisms and things like, and things like that, techniques, methods that are hopefully scriptural <laughs> that we employ in our, in our walk with the Lord to keep us from going after the world, the flesh, and the devil and to keep us on the right track of walking worthy of him. I would say that there may be things that you may not even really actually be aware of because they have become godly habits, if you will, just the way you, you'll think or the way you'll react to a certain situation that God has given you and, and is part of your toolkit, your skill set, to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. But we've said, okay, but there are clearly some things that God gives us in Scripture to do that with, and we've seen some of these, and in fact, I said, okay, I'm going to give you my uh, short list of techniques, of methods, and really they're essentially pretty much this. The, the first one here, let me flip the slide, we said was counting the cost, and I don't know that I see that one really appear. The other three that I have we'll find here on the board that we've already discussed somewhat in class, but we'll go through them anyway because I went to all the trouble of putting slides together. So we're, we're going to look at them and see what we think. Right? Uh, but anyway, counting the cost, we looked at these verses last week, and I've been kind of stalling because I thought maybe Brother Keith Bentley would show up late today. He came to me after the class Sunday and said, you know about this, counting the cost. I said, well, that's a great, Keith. Why, why didn't you say that? Ah, you know, you know. I said, well, we'll come back next week, and, and I'll have you say it because the class needs to hear this, and he's not here. And I don't guess he's going to be here. But anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and steal... Uh, Brother Keith's thunder and say what he was talking about was to say that um, when we count the cost of not denying ungodliness and, and worldly lust, the impact that we may have on others, in fact, may even, if you will, contribute to their going to hell, or certainly not contribute to their getting saved from hell and going to heaven. If we ourselves are pawns of our flesh or of the worldly lust, uh, any aspect of ungodliness, that tends to uh, damage your testimony, doesn't it? It tends to damage your effectiveness, our effectiveness, towards being a testimony and having this testimony of our conscience that causes rejoicing. And it really does, uh, it causes us loss of reward at the judgment seat of Christ, but what it does for them. Now, um, I think God's bigger than any one of us. And, and God's heart and desire, I mean, if God's going to give his son himself to die to save every single person who will believe on him, I don't think he's going to let himself be limited by our um, slothfulness, if you will. I, I think he will circumvent us and get, if someone is reaching out, if someone is responding to the testimony of God in the heavens and the, and the creation and that sort of thing, I believe God has obligated himself to get that person the truth, but it's still their, their responsibility to believe on it. And as people receive truth, I've found that even as a Christian, that as I have received truth that God has shown me in his word, either through preaching or teaching or just through study, or even reading somebody else's writings, but 
particularly, especially the scriptures, if God has shown me truth and I've received that truth, that has enabled me, I think, to move on and receive more truth. You know, success breeds success with this thing. And so, uh, but the aspect here of, of God commissions us and uses us in his system, in his method of saving souls. And if we don't do our part with our testimony and our witnessing to those others who are lost, then we have hindered their getting saved. Now, like I said, I think God can still work around us and get somebody else to do our job. And in fact, you know, we see that all the time. Uh, if everybody in our church was doing everything that they could, everybody, nobody would be overburdened because we would all be getting it done. But we often have, and in, in it's kind of one of the human laws, if you will, natural, natural laws, that about typically 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Also, 20% of the people cause 80% of the problems. That's where pastors have to spend a lot of their time. You know, it's that, and it's that 60% in the middle that kind of just kind of floats along, and we're either going to, you know, I'm not going to cause trouble, but I'm not going to go out of my way. You know, I'll show up, I'll do this ministry of presence, which is vital, it's important, but I'm not going to really lift a finger or my wallet, but, you know, that sort of thing. Anyway, <laughs> where I'm going is that God can still work around our slothfulness to get his will done. And I'm so thankful. I don't know who, could, who else could have witnessed to me but didn't. I only know those who could and did, and I'm thankful for them. But be that as it may, when you count the cost, that what it all amounts to is that I know that when my Aunt B gets to the judgment seat of Christ, I mean, I may be way behind her in line, but I'm going to say, she, she did it for me, Lord. You know, don't forget, Aunt B did that. She witnessed to me. She took me to church. She got me saved. Okay? Okay. Um, <laughs> had she not done that, and there were other people who witnessed to me, I, I think that I'd like to think that I would still get saved because I was blessed to have at least three good, you no, know, four, no, I can think of more than that even, good, solid witnesses. You know, I was pretty stubborn uh, about not getting saved until finally it just was, you know, Aunt B just poured it on and it was just more than I could handle. And the spirit overwhelmed my flesh, and we, hey, whew, I'm saved, all right? But I don't know who could have but didn't, but they're going to know. <laughs> count the cost. Count the cost to other people and even to our, in terms of our own reward when it comes to denying ungodliness in a worldly lust. Now, the other thing I said, the next thing that I said was, as we've already said this up here, someone gave it to us, is make no provision for the flesh, Romans 13, 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Our flesh is a very wily thing, very slippery, very conniving. It will take, if you give it a little chink in your armor, it'll just say, there it is, you know. I mean, it's kind of like water. It just kind of flows right into any opening. And, oh, man, I just got my socks wet, you know what I mean? And, oh, man, I just got my testimony, you know, stained or whatever. But the flesh will do that. And so we have to put up barriers, if you will. Make no provision. Don't, you know, set your search engine on, on mo at least moderate, if not safe, okay? Um, don't, turn, don't turn your search engine's uh, screening off. Man, man, the stuff that pops up there, whoa, get that off of there. Just on an innocent search, it's kind of like, what has, you know, I'm looking up, uh, what do you call those dogs, golden doodles? You look up golden doodles, and here's, and here's, what's a naked woman got to do with golden doodles? You know, it's like, get the, oh, okay, that's not, you know, you know what I'm talking about? You have to make no provision, don't let those, don't, don't subscribe to those premium channels that like to put stuff up. When I used to travel uh, in Europe, in Europe especially, my goodness, I mean, uh, the stuff you see there is just kind of commonplace, and it's like, oh, good grief. Well, I used to travel with a, a NATO evaluation team, and we would go to different bases and evaluate their warfighting capabilities. And whenever I got there, you know, you get there, um, you travel one day, you get there, get checked into the hotel, and you get start getting everything all set up to have a briefing and kick off the exercise for the you know, three or four or five days that you're going to do it the next day. Well, as soon as I got into the 
into the uh, hotel room because usually I get back to the hotel room late at night, and that was not the right time. That was not a good time to go channel surfing in Europe. It was late at night. So when I got in during the daytime, I would find on the TV, I would find the news channel, you know, CNN International or BBC or something, because that's what I wanted to watch when I got off work was the news channel stuff. I didn't want to go surfing through and, and see that ungodly stuff late at night and try to go to sleep with that in my eye gate, you know what I mean? Make no provision for the flesh. And so you can think about what might be your um, particular weakness, the sin which doth so easily beset us kind of thing. And you say, okay, I, I need to, not only do I need to not entertain that, I need to put up a barricade. I need to make no provision. If I'm going to make a provision for that part of my flesh, I'm going to provide for it not to have access to my soul to my heart. So make no provision for the flesh because it will take advantage just like that. And there come the worldly lust. And there comes what? It may not be that I'm going to go out and commit adultery because I happen to see something on TV, but I just don't need that image in my mind. I don't need that because when I'm thinking about something like that, I'm not thinking about this. Okay, and I don't have time to waste on anything other, and, and this is not wasting. And I can read some other stories. I can read some things and, and that sort of thing. Excuse me. I can read other magazines and that sort of thing. But if it gets un, starts getting worldly lust and ungodliness, just get rid of it. Make no provision for the flesh. All right? Then the next thing that I have for us here is to actually to study the Word. Now, we, did, we talked about that to saturate, meditate, memorize scripture, study the scripture. This enables me, um, again, if I'm putting this in, I'm not putting something ungodly in, okay? But this enables me, this enables me not only to redeem the time what, that I'm actually spending when I study and meditate on the word of God, it enables me to carry forward once I stop that, when I go on to what I have to do next, because I simply have so many other, as we all do, we have other responsibilities in life. We can't just sit and, and read and study our Bible 24-7. Uh, I got to tell you, our pastor used to come close to that. When he was young, he was like a super sponge, man. He was buying um, books. We used to have, there used to be like a mail order bookstore kind of thing, and they put out, like, it was like, Scripture, something, or maybe he would remember, but they put out a single page advertisement about every month, a list of the books that they had in stock with super duper prices on them. I think that's how he bought the pulpit commentary that he has in there. Probably the only guy I know that's not only owned the pulpit commentary, but no doubt read all the way through the thing. I mean, we're talking, you know, Encyclopedia Britannica for preaching, okay? And, but every, he would, he would be waiting for that thing to come in the post office in a mailbox there in Turkey at Inslick Air Base so he could see what else he could send off for. I mean, you know, he was buying books left and right to study. Uh, and yet somehow he still managed to have Bethany and James and Timothy and he still managed to, <laughs> you know, work a full-time job and all that kind of stuff. But even, but even then... The time that we, st we spend in studying the Word of God not only blesses us as we're doing it then, but it also is something to take with us and to carry us on through the rest of the day and, and even on into the week as we need to. Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman. This is work we're talking about. That needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. And of course, we've, been studied, we've studied that a lot here, not only in our class, but here in our church, because rightly dividing the Word of truth is how we are able to properly delineate what would otherwise be considered contradictions, if you will, and conflicts in our scripture, and just to understand this all fits together like a fine Swiss clock. Watch, you know, it's, it just works that way. Study, study. Psalm 119.11, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. That's what I'm talking about. Not only is it a benefit while we're studying, but when we take, away, take it away with us, we put it in our heart, 
And it helps us, and that helps come to mind when we're, when we're tempted. And the temptations are out there. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. They're out there. But the Word of God can spring up as a, as a wellspring, as it says, and push that stuff out from getting into our brain. Like, oh, okay, I don't need that. Whether it's something we see or something we think, something we feel, the Word of God is there. I had a, a fella, um, in, when I, I dabbled for a time, you know, you try to figure out when you get retired from your regular job and you're developing uh, missionary support, you're looking for something to kind of help make ends meet, fill the gaps. And I, I dabbled for a bit in multi-level marketing with a guy that was uh, marketing this. And it was a good company, good product, and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and, and, but, and this guy was a believer. But, and the thing that got me, the guy was, you know, he was kind of a, a slick kind of salesman kind of guy. He was actually a, a physician's assistant licensed physician assistant got off into selling these supplements. But the thing about it is, is that just in his, in his regular conversation, he was very quick to bring up scripture to, as, a, as a reason for why he was going to do something or why he thought something. Well, you know, it says, the Bible says, well, you know, the Bible says, it says in Psalms, it says, it says in Ephesians, you know, it's like, wow, this guy, you know, just, he, he let the word of God, if you will, permeate his life. His, his daily life. Well, now you show up. I went ahead, Keith, and gave your, your very brilliant point about counting the cost. And Well, anyway, excuse me. And uh, but anyway, I'm glad you're here, brother. I'm just messing with you. Um, where was I? What was I saying, Sam? You were talking about a slick salesman. That yes, he used the word of God. It permeated. Yes, thank you, brother. I was paying that. Yes, sir, you are. <laughs> Preacher did that to me one time. He said something. I had been chasing a rabbit in my mind from something he said. And he says, what about this? He I said, huh? He said, oh, never mind, you know. <laughs> at any rate, at any rate, this guy Dan was very good at taking the word of God and salting his speech with it. And it was kind of like, well, you know what? I appreciate that, that somebody can, can, not only was that a blessing to him, that was a blessing to me, that he would have the word of God readily at his fingertips. You know, just like, like this guy that stands up there all the time, you know, like boom, 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 boom. He wasn't as good as, Dan wasn't as good as Jim, but that's okay. He was better than I was. And it prompted me to start thinking, okay, I want to think Bible. I want to think Bible. You know, they say when, you know, when you go to learn a second language, you know you're getting it when you can think in it instead of having to, you know, translate in your mind from English to Tagalog or whatever, you know. If you start thinking in, in Deutsche, yeah, or whatever it is, I can, uh, by the way, I can say probably hello and goodbye and where's the bathroom in about 12 different languages. But you have to be careful with that, with a native speaker of that language, because once you say, you know, hi, how are you, where's the bathroom, they think, oh, you speak my language. And it's like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, despacio, despacio, por favor. <laughs> anyway, where was I now, Sam? You were mumbling in tongues. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing anything for you. Evidently not doing much for me either. But, uh, but anyway, permeating our language, our life with the Word of God. Study the Word in uh, Romans 54. For whatsoever things were written for aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Patience and comfort of the Scriptures. From studying the stuff that's been written before that gives us hope. Hope. Hope to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, hope to live righteously, hope to think soberly, hope to hang on to a testimony that, that causes rejoicing, hope by learning the scriptures, all right? Next, and finally, keep close, and we talked about this, keep close to godly influences. That's in here somewhere too. Help me out here. I know I have it up here. I thought. There it is. Thank you. Right below, make no provision for the flesh. Make provision for the spiritual aspect. And in, in church is a, is a prime example of that. Proverbs 27, 17 
says, Iron sharpeneth iron, as a man, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. I'm going to make sort of a, grand, uh, a sweeping statement here. I guess I've got to run through my, you know, do the, run through my data bank here to make sure. I, I have to say, I know I've said something like this in here before. I've not always been as desirous of going to church as I should. On occasion, the flesh does rear up and say, oh, man, let's just stay home and chill out, man, or let's just sleep in, or let's just, you know, I didn't used to have to set an alarm for Sunday mornings, and now, I, I, you know, the alarm went off this morning. Uh, but at any rate, you know, I have to say, I think I can honestly say that while I've not, I have to confess that I've not always been as eager to go as I should have been, I've never read it, regretted going when I did to get with the body of believers. Even I have been in some situations where it was kind of like, good grief, I can't believe I just sat through, you know, 30 or 40 minutes of that guy banging his lips, you know. What is that? Have you ever been to some of those services where it's kind of like, wait a minute, where's God in that, you know? don't know what's going on in the mind of God, when you hear a preacher like that, mm -hmm. you need to trust the Lord that somebody is going to be getting that message I and hope just so. pray for that situation. Yeah, amen. But, You're right. But you have to be careful to de despise not. Amen. Well said. Well said. And in fact, I hope you all got to hear that online at home. Um, did you all hear that okay in here? Did you hear that okay? Well, you have to... Yes, indeed we do. And you do have to go. And even and um, when we're traveling and we go to a church, and even where we go down in Florida, uh, dear sweet, a uh, small church there, believes King James Bible, got the right music, good stuff, you know, but not dispensational. So every once in a while they'll say something, it's kind of like, <laughs> no, that's not how it works. You know, but... God please use it. Yes, God, God please use it anyway. And he does, and he does. And oftentimes, the, even, but I, the, what I was talking about in terms of, of uh, what I would consider poor preaching, uh, there's poor preaching, there's poor music, there's poor, <laughs> you know, friendliness, there's, there's, there are issues with human beings, okay? <clears throat> but you have to say, wait a minute, Christ died for them, and evidently, they know that, and they believed on him. And they're my brother, they're my sister. And so we look for that, <clears throat> that element of camaraderie. I mean, you know what? In this day and age, when I find a fellow veteran, I mean, even if he's a Navy guy or a Marine, I can still have fellowship because we have that uniform, literally that uniform experience. You know, we... I notice there's a lot of ads these days. You guys ever go to Camp Lejeune? Yeah, yeah there's, there's ads these days about, I guess, the drinking water. The water was bad at Camp Lejeune for a long time, and now they're saying, you could have a, you know, if you were ever there, I thought, well, I was never at Camp Lejeune, praise the Lord, you know. Never had that pleasure. Did you, Charles, have that pleasure? No. See, Charles is an Air Force guy, so we, we fellowship really well. All right, well, anyway, what I'm saying is that and it, and it happens a lot of times when you're overseas in, in missions work that you find another believer, they might be an, uh, an E-free guy or they might, you know, be a Southern Baptist or whatever. They might even be a charismatic. We've got some friends that are of the charismatic persuasion that are friends, that are our brothers and sisters. We love them dearly. Why? Because, because <clears throat> like I told my uh, chief, my last chief master sergeant that I worked with in the Air Force, who was a uh, a believer, a dear man of God, of a different denominational persuasion than I, and I said, you know, chief, there are too many people that want to kill us for what we have in common. I don't see any reason for us to kill each other for where we disagree, where we might differ. You know, when you got somebody, when you got, when you're surrounded by alligators, you know. You, you like that, uh, the, the crocodile, you know, the crocodile hunter or whatever. You, you like having one of them with you. And so it's kind of good to have that support, that, um, that godly influence, even if it's not 
even if they're not King James, even if they'll turn their TV set to contemporary, like, wait a minute, that's Christian? But no, uh, I'm just saying that the closer we can get to this right here, the stronger we get from one another. Iron sharpeneth iron. And Paul said in Romans 1.11, he said, For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end ye may be established. Now, Paul was in the ministry to minister to other people. He's saying that to the folks at Rome. He says, that is, <laughs> it's not... I'm not doing this just for you. I'm also getting a blessing myself. He says, that is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Our mutual faith, particularly those of us who, you know, the, the closer you, you know, uh, Amos says, how can two uh, walk together unless they agree or something like that? Um, the closer you are in your doctrine in your, and in your application of that doctrine, the more, the closer the fellowship that you can have, for sure, you know. And in fact, that's what you're looking for when you're, when you're looking for a mate. You're looking for someone that you can enjoy her company, or if you're a her, his company in such a way that, hey, you know what? Regina told me, she said, I used to think, man, do I want to wake up to see that face every day for the rest of my life? And, she, and, and I knew things were going really good when she said, think I could wake up to yours, you know, like, oh, okay, we're getting somewhere, you know. She might just say yes if I asked her to marry me, and sure enough, she did. That fellowship that we want to have is derived from our having this book in common, this Holy Spirit of God in common, and that mutual faith that <clears throat> strengthens not just you, but strengthens me. Not just me, but strengthens you. That mutual faith, that, like I said, that military service uniform experience, that mutual faith, that, or, um, <laughs> I suppose you can get it from being a, a, a Michigan fan, you know, or being a Buckeye fan. I only know one of them. Uh, but, you see what I'm saying? By that mutual faith. We're, and, and, of course, we're saved by the faith of Christ. So this mutual faith that we have predominantly is his faith. All right? But we also have our own practical faith. How we exercise the gifts and callings that God has for us it, through the course of our life. And as we find... Um, I mean, you have to purpose to sit down and talk to somebody and say, hey, Brother Sam, what did you do for a living? What did you do for a living? Uh, no, I was just a farmer. Just <laughs> as, as little as possible, right? Carpenter. Carpenter, amen. My grandfather was a carpenter, and so were my uncles and my dad. Um, but I didn't know that about Sam because that's kind of, that's really kind of, if you will, background noise because what matters more to me, I mean, I appreciate the fact that he was a carpenter, and I would like to talk to you about that, because that's kind of, that's cool stuff to me. Uh, but what I appreciate more is his love for that book, and his faithfulness to our assembly, and his ministry here to us. That's the predominant thing about me that gives me, th that I share in mutual faith with Brother Sam. But it's worth getting to know the rest of Brother Sam, and it's, and it's worth having conversations to say, Hey, what about, and, and it's one of the things I like about men's prayer breakfast, especially to breakfast. I try to go and, normally I try to go and sit by somebody uh, that I don't necessarily sit with so we can have a conversation and get to know, get to know that Brother Steve's a truck driver, you know. I still don't know what Brother Michael did you know, or does for a living, you know. Same thing with Brother Terry. You know, there's things that I just, gotta, I got to keep coming to church and to, and to uh, men's prayer breakfast so I can get to know you guys, you know. That mutual faith. You know, that comforts us, that strengthens us, and in doing so enables us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. You think I want to disappoint my fellowship or sour my fellowship with Brother Sam by him seeing me come out of a nightclub or something or whatever it is, you know, or have him hear me 
cussing or something, you know? You think I want to do that? That count the cost aspect kicks in there too because when you do that kind of stuff, Sam says, oh boy, I thought Brother Hugh was, was kind of a, you know, a godly guy. I thought he had some, some faith going on here, you know? You don't want to destroy that. You want to be able to enjoy that, to relish that. You want to use that to strengthen you and to enable you to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, and it will. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. One of the reasons I like to get around and greet as many of the folks here, it kind of irks me sometimes. Regina will say, well, so-and-so in church this morning, because she's, uh, Regina's in, uh, right now she's in the Sunday school nursery every week, and then after that she does the junior high girls in the group time thing. So the only time she gets in here on Sunday mornings is she tries to get in here during handshaking time so she can see as many people as she can as well. And she'll say, well, so-and-so there today? I'm like, I don't know. I didn't see him, you know. And it's like, ah, you know, I missed them. I don't know if they're there or not. Um, because it is an edification. It's comfort to be together. It's edifying one another. And that enables us, that enables us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, does it not? To be strengthened in the brethren, strengthened in a book, strengthened in the brethren. Double whammy. Boom, boom. You know, punch the devil's lights out. Denying ungodliness and worldly lust. That's, and like I said, there's probably other ways that we really thought about it. We could go and there's nuances and shadings of these different things. But I am so thankful that one, God has given us this book that's got this stuff in it, and that God has given us this church that's got this stuff in it to help me, to help me to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Because there's something else God wants us to do. He doesn't want us dabbling. He doesn't want us consumed by or anything like that with this ungodly worldly lust because he's got something else for us to do, and we're going to see that next week. Father, we thank you so much for our time together this morning. We pray that you would indeed help us to appropriate these provisions that you've made for us to enable us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Help us to do it, Lord. God, help us to do it for the, the testimony of our conscience, or that we might have the conscience that is to be rejoiced in for the glory of Christ and the good of other folks. Thank you, Father. Bless our time as we go into our worship service. Bless our visitors as they come and help us to minister to them and to each other. Bless our preacher as he preaches. Bless his voice and his mind, his clarity, and the power of the message that you've laid on his heart to give to us, God. Open our hearts that we'll attend to the things that Brother Jim says to us today. Again, for the glory of your Son. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, and thanks for tuning in.